Hey everyone, Omar and I just visited Colonel Headquarters in Culver City, right next to sunny Los Angeles, California. My name is Ryan Tanaka. Welcome to Neuropod. How come we have so much data about our lives, but know zero about our brain? If you ask someone what their car's tire pressure is, they can find out right away. How about how quickly their computer is able to download files? Questions like these are easily answerable because we can measure them. But when it comes to our brain, we know so little. Brian Johnson and the team at Kernel are looking to change that. Because our channel covers topics about the Elon Musk founded company Neuralink, I see that people have a wide range of views about the company and brain interfaces. The comments below the video show that polarization. And during the past year and a half, I've found that some people hate Elon Musk. Others don't think artificial intelligence is a threat at all. And others simply cannot fathom having a Neuralink chip implanted into their brain via cutting a hole in their skull. If you're one of the folks who prefer the non-invasive brain interface approach, it's worth paying attention to the work that Kernel is doing with their wearable brain interface helmet called Flow. The team has the aspiration of getting Flow into at least 1 million households, and they're making progress on doing just that. During our visit to headquarters, I got to use Flow and scan my brain activity while playing a first-person shooter video game. And now you can have the opportunity to come to headquarters in LA and get your brain scanned as well. Stay tuned till the end of the video to find out how. Take a look at the sweet graphic of my brain activity. This experience started with adjusting the flow device to my head. The headset was heavier yet less rigid than I expected. Because each of the little 52 modules are spring-loaded, the headset conformed to my head very well. Since the detectors rely on light, the team adjusted some settings in consideration of my dark black hair. And next, it was time to play the game. The experience included two phases. During the first, I shot at the ball in the middle of the screen. This was fairly simple as the ball never moved position and appeared in a rhythmic pattern. The second phase, however, showed multiple balls in a variety of locations, and shooting at these required a fast reaction and good hand-eye coordination, which I apparently did not have after seeing my low score. This was the result. The colorful graphic shown here was generated using the lasers and detectors in the module of the helmet. In this clip, I asked Brian to explain what's under the hood of flow. The, the fundamental concept is that light is shown into your, your head. Uh, it's a technology that's safe, it's been in use for 30 years. And you get more sun into your, your brain when you walk out in the sun on a given day. But you get uh, light shown into your head and the photons that travel into your, your brain scatter and absorb. And then a few of them come back out. So it's like putting a flashlight you know, in your mouth and seeing it come out inside of your cheek, it illuminates. And so when we get photons that come back out, we can reconstruct what is going on. And what we're looking at is the oxygenation and deoxygenation of hemoglobin. So as neurons fire, we each have 80 or so billion neurons. As they fire, chemically and electrically, they ask for oxygen. And hemoglobin delivers oxygen for the firing these neurons, and we're measuring that blood flow in the brain, looking at the oxygenation, deoxygenation, so we can create these rich maps of activity of what's going on inside your brain. So when you get your report from playing, mm -hmm. you'll see the regions of your brain. Later, we came across Stacy, who is working on assembling a flow device. The exploded view of the module is pretty cool to see, especially when you think about how big this would have been prior to the engineering work of the Kernel team. Here's CEO Brian and CTO Ryan describing the engineering work required to decrease the footprint of the device from the time Ryan joined in 2018 until today. Yeah, so the laser is a big box, but it enables uh, one laser, four detectors. Uh, okay. So this is sampling, and for context of what you wore yeah. in there, you've got 52 of those modules, and each one of those modules has a laser and six detectors. Okay, yeah. Yeah, super uh, downsized. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's awesome. legitimately like a, a mainframe to a PC mm -hmm. uh, miniaturization. Um, I think it's, uh, if, you, if you looked at this by weight, it's 10,000 10, times lower volume per channel is the rate of miniaturization. 
Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy, or FNIRS, has been around for 30 years, is safe, and has thousands of publications demonstrating its capabilities. As Brian discussed, the technology used to be expensive, non-user friendly, and room sized. Mainstream neuro measurement required miniaturization of the technology at the scale of mainframes becoming PCs. The team shared some metrics with us. After five years of full stack development from photon to machine learning, compared to existing commercial grade systems, kernel flow is now 10,000 times lower physical volume per channel, 200 times higher sampling rate, 100 times higher photon throughput, 100 times lower weight, 10 times lower power, 10 times higher dynamic range, and the same amount of accuracy and functional performance. Kernel is making neuro measurement mainstream. From what I can tell, they've built the world's most versatile neuroimaging system packaged into a wearable technology. Organizations are using kernel flow to measure the neuro effects of psychedelics, pain, gaming, emotions, aging, and others. Building flow, however, is no simple task. Brian and Ryan shared details about the silicone wafer used to manufacture the chips for kernels flow modules. Wow. So this is what it means to design things at scale. So this is a 12 inch CMOS wafer. Uh, this came from our fab. And on this is around 8,000 of the Danube detectors that uh, I just showed you. So we can produce these things uh, in mass very easily. Uh, you know, place an order with the fab, uh, get a lot of 25 or however many wafers we want, and turn them into headsets. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see just like the sheer number of devices here. Brian also discusses scaling manufacturing as the next major step for Kernel. Now, this is a, is a pretty fierce narrowing filter to say, take every available technology candidate, assess each one, and then take each one through the entire life cycle through production and to score it and say, does this thing scale to millions in quantity? Right. Can you piggyback on the back of the global infrastructure of electronics? Right. And so like this, for example, this chip, the, the number of chip fabs that could do this, yeah. like one or two. Okay. And it was the critical enabler of the technology to exist. And so a lot of people who looked in the, in the field of optics for non-invasive imaging didn't necessarily understand the technology well enough to see that you could map this all the way through the end. And so this is why it's been such a serpentine exploratory thing for us is we didn't even know the full extent of what exactly we could build with them. They, hadn't, they didn't know it either. And so we took everything to its, to its limits. Uh, but that's really what it's taken for Kernel to be at this point. And that's why most people assessed it was impossible to give over at. Going back to the results of the flow experience, in this graphic, the highlighted blue areas indicate where my brain was more active during the first phase of the experience. The orange areas indicate where activity was more intense during the second phase with the moving targets. So the type of brain activity that we measure is looking at how uh, hard your brain is working over the whole like outside of your brain. Um, so that's what we're doing. So that's what I'm showing you here. And the color scale, the way that it works is um, if it's blue, that actually means it's more active during the control condition. So when you're just clicking in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And then if it's red, that means it's more active when you're playing the game. Cool. So we have your two runs here. And this is, um, this is not your structural image, so this is not your actual brain, but it is your actual brain activity, if that makes sense. Because yeah, yeah. we, we didn't actually measure your brain, just your, your brain activity. I have almost zero shooting game experience. And by comparison, what do you think the brain activity of a professional gamer would look like? Might his brain be much brighter than mine? About a month ago, Colonel partnered with AimLab and Call of Duty world champion Seth Abner, who's also known as Scump. AimLab developed a unique version of the game GridShot so that people can understand the relationship between their brains and the tasks that they perform. Again, isn't it crazy that we know so little about measuring our own brain? Here's a clip from my interview with Brian Johnson discussing the comparison to a Fitbit wearable that helps measure other things for our body. It sounds to me similar to like a Fitbit that's continuously giving us data about our bodies. Um, and it's, it's not a lot of data, but with the brain and with a brain interface like kernel flow, then you're getting more data and about most like, or arguably a more important organ in your body. Um, do you think that's a fair comparison? 
Yes, I do. Yeah, a wearable is a really great entry point into doing it. And I agree. If you have a wearable on your wrist, which usually some of these devices use a similar technology, they use lasers to look at. Right. So we're using a similar technology, and they're looking at veins as the source of information, and we have an entire organ to look at, and it's our brains. Yeah, we we really are. We have a lot of hope that there's a lot of room to play with here, and. It could be there's a lot, a lot to dis- be discovered. The thing that's w- also kind of tricky about this is people uh, mistake their self awareness with it being a robust sensor system for their brain. So, for example, if um, if you went to the cardiologist and the cardiologist said, "You say I want to know the health of my heart," and the cardiologist, cardiologist said, "Close your eyes." Think about it. How does it feel? You'd say, "Cool, doctor." Also, I want EKG. I want to know my arterial plaques. I want to know. Right? You want measurements, but we do that for our brain today, and so uh, our brain is hiding right behind our eyes, and we make the we mis- make the mistake of assuming that we know what's happening in our brain because we have self awareness. But it's the same error in assuming that I could self-introspect and find high blood pressure or high cholesterol. You can't feel those things. You have to get measured. And so how many equivalents are there in the brain of things we can't self-discern that we will be able to assess with our system? This is the discipline of the man leading the charge to build flow. The kernel flow has not only gotten positive feedback from initial testers, but also from publications. In the Journal of Biomedical Options, Guest editor Dimitras Gorpas remarks, Kernel Flow is the world's first wearable full head coverage TD Fnir system that maintains or improves on the performance of existing benchtop systems and has the potential to achieve its mission of making neural measurements mainstream. I'm really looking forward to what the brain has yet to reveal. Like Neuralink, Kernel was founded by another entrepreneur who formerly built a near billion dollar payments company. Brian Johnson is a fascinating individual who's working to make humanity thrive. I've been inspired during our time researching Kernel and getting to understand the philosophical ideas that guide Brian's thinking. He shares thoughts with clear language and makes you really question the assumptions your brain is making every day on your behalf. Here's some of the beginning of my conversation with him discussing one of his other projects called Project Blueprint. So we're wondering how much younger you've gotten. (laughs) Well, I've... As far as we can tell, we set a world record last year in uh, 2021. I reversed my epigenetic age by 5.2 years in eight months. Do you mind ex- continuing to elaborate on how you got to that point? What were some of the steps that you took to do that? Mm-hmm. I mean, so the, the age, the biological age measurement is a nuanced topic. And so I've done hundreds of measurements uh, for all things on my body. So I've measured the age of my lung capacity. Okay, yeah, so, so the concept of, of age, uh, we all understand the chronological age. Biological age measurement is a new concept. And so the idea is, of course, you can measure things on, uh, measure biological markers that have reference ranges, which are just statistical sample sizes to say, we know that if a person scores here, on this that their average, you know, their age is 17 or 57 or whatever the case may be. But you need to have a statistical baseline of, you know, an age reference range. And so I've measured my biological age via hundreds of markers. My lungs and my heart, my hearing, my skin, my DNA methylation, which is the epigenetic age. And so uh, it's a much more precise way to assess what my true age is by taking all these measurements versus just looking at one number of my chronological age. Yeah, right right now, for this year, we have two goals. One is to, to finish up whole body measurement. And so there's uh, various things we can measure. So you can do biofluids, which include blood and urine and stool, things like that. Mm-hmm. You can also do imaging, so ultrasound and MRI. And so we're combining all of these measurement modalities to do this whole body measurement. And so once we have these hundreds of measurements, sometimes, like for example, the heart could have a dozen or more markers on the age profile. 
And so once we complete that whole thing, you'd be the first in history to get whole body biological age measurement, first, uh, first in history. And then the second thing we're trying to do is assess where are we at on age escape velocity. Mm -hmm. So basically the fountain of youth. Sure. And so the, a lot of people think, uh, well, I guess ask the question, is the fountain of youth going to show up in 50 years, 100 years, maybe never, and will it be in the form of a magic pill or will it be something else? And our hypothesis is maybe it's here now and it's just hiding in thousands of scientific papers and a lifestyle that's pretty rigorous, which is what I do. So, in other words, if you were to stop what you're doing yeah. for a month or a year, do you think it's likely that you would be able to get back to that lower age? I would hypothesize and say that's likely the case, okay. that these interventions, just because we methodically go about implementing the interventions and then measuring it, and so my, I would imagine that by stopping doing them, it would have the same consequence in reverse, but we haven't tested that. Sure. <laughs> so maybe intentionally breaking the cycle. Yeah, it's, it's, a good, yeah. yeah it's a good hypothesis test. Yeah. Um, well, the, the super veggie and, <laughs> and the pudding, nutty pudding uh, are probably big components to, yeah. to this. Um, can, you, can you talk about what goes into those uh, and, and just talk about like, the daily routine and um, making sure that you're making decisions previously so that you don't have to make them after you wake up. Yeah, yeah. I've been working on this concept called my autonomous self. Mm -hmm. So people are familiar with an autonomous car or a, you know, a self-driving uh, autopilot on a plane. Uh, I've been trying to do that for my body and dietary intake. And specifically, I fired my conscious mind. So my mind can no longer look at a menu and decide what to eat. It can't go into the pantry and choose things from the, from the selection of items. It can't go to a party and, and choose things that are everyone else is eating. Uh, my organs are the agents of decisions. So I guess it's kind of like a DAO, like a decentralized autonomous organization where the agents are my liver and my heart and other parts of my biological processes and they determine what they need for optimal health. And so the diet I have now is every single thing in the diet has scientific backing of gold standard scientific evidence. And so super veggie, you know, I eat over 70 pounds of vegetables in a given month, which is more than I've ever had in my entire life. And so these things are all backed by rigorous scientific uh, uh, papers, and then I implement them. But to give you an idea, I mean, yes, I, I have a routine where all decisions are made for me before the day starts, mm -hmm. and I, my only responsibility is to roll through the routine and not deviate from it. Like, just don't get off the rails. Mm -hmm. As he mentions in the conversation, Project Blueprint aims to measure all 70 plus organs of the body and then maximally reverse the quantified biological age of each. PayPal acquired Brian's company Braintree Venmo in 2013 for $800 million. Despite this achievement, he experienced deep challenges and chronic depression for 10 years. If you're interested in learning more, we'll link to our detailed video about Brian and Colonel here in the description. I was fortunate to ask Brian how he got out of this decade-long funk. I mean, that was a frustrating experience. Not only miserable and frustrating, because I did stop at nothing to research ways to fix it. And I was... I failed in every single thing I did for 10 years. And so have, being able to have a device like Flow would have been very helpful because I would have potentially been able to, again, put numbers to my brain and make the process scientific mm -hmm. versus the guessing like I was of how do I feel. This, you know, my subjective self-assessment is unreliable. It's like the worst way for me to go about that path. So, yeah, I mean, you know, whether we can de identify a depression biomarker for flow of TBD, but at least having reliable, reproducible data on our brain. Again, it, the science and engineering both start with counting. If we can put numbers to these things, sure. you give birth to a whole ecosystem of people who can build on top. Okay, um, dur during that decade of depression, did you ever get the sense that your brain was controlling you more so than 
you were controlling it. Yes. And I still think that's true. My, my fundamental hypothesis in the future is that our path, our most promising path, is the demotion of the conscious mind. So it's what I did with Blueprint, and it's identified that my mind was going to continually make bad decisions all the time. Mm-hmm. Like I could, I would, you know, I, I can bet on it. I know if I get put into a circumstance, and I'm pitting myself against my own self-discipline and that thing, mm-hmm. I'm going to make the bad decision almost all the time. And so, I'm my big, I am my own worst enemy in every way. Not just from bad decisions, but. I am mean to myself, right? Like I have terrible thoughts. I can't turn that off. Mm-hmm. So the mind is, it's a brutal place to be. Mm-hmm. And, but even with Blueprint, by just having the system of food, I've become much nicer to myself. Because mm-hmm. I no longer have to beat myself up over bad decisions and the emotional wear and tear of like, did I do this right or wrong? Or I feel bad because of this thing. So I've really been able to clean up my, my own mental state just by that thing. And I want to further doing that. And so, but the key thing is, so this sounds really scary to people, right? Like to demote your conscious mind uh, because people are like, oh, I'm going to decide and do, I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But the key is that we all recognize this thing inside of us that we all make bad decisions mm-hmm. all the time and we can't stop it. And, and the most important point here is a character trait, a, a variable that you want to analyze very carefully on is a system, a, 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 a system's level of intelligence is can the system of intelligence avoid making the same mistake twice? With computational intelligence, we can do that. We, if we identify an error, you can write a line of code. You, with, uh, you know, there's several techniques in software, in machine learning, to stop the repeating of mistakes. As a human, I can live an entire life mm-hmm. and make the same mistake tens of thousands of times. It's a major flaw in our intelligence in that we repeat the same mistakes. And it's actually the most significant variable in whether and how we map out the future of our existence. So like, am I scared of AI? I'm scared of myself. Yeah. I mean, did you, sorry, did you finish your thought? That's it. Yeah. So, sometimes I think about, um, well, our, our world is dynamic. And so if we, at one point in time, think that we made the wrong decision and we... Program that out. Program that out. Well, the world changed. Now all of a sudden, we have this thing that's programmed out that was a bad decision before, but now it would have been a good decision. Yes. How do you think about that? Yeah. So I mean, this is where everything I've been working on for the past five years coalesces. So if you think about the future of intelligent existence, let's just talk on a five year, five hundred year time scale. The systems that are going to do well are going to compound in ability. Going to generate gains and generate gains on top of gains, it will ladder up. Mm-hmm. So computational intelligence has those characteristics. That's why it moves so fast, is we scaffold up that compound of gains. Mm-hmm. Institutions are a similar compound of gains. We build out the rule of law, we write laws, and as a society, we build out institutions that level society up. Mm-hmm. And then, but if you then say, and it's science, the same thing. We build upon principles of science, and that also is a field. That's why in the 14th century, we were doing prayer circles for the bubonic plague, and now we're doing mRNA vaccines in 66 days after detection, after full genome sequencing of a virus. Mm-hmm. And so if you say, what system of intelligence is not like the others? It's humans. And we mistakenly think that we are our smartphones, that we are our computers, that we are the GPS systems. Mm-hmm. We're not. And so a human as a system of intelligence is not building compound gains. We're not too dissimilar to humans were a thousand years ago. And so this is where brain interfaces come in, is if you had a system to measure the brain and science and engineering begin with numbers, it formally allows us to bridge ourselves to these other systems of intelligence so that we can begin logging compounded gains as our intelligence. That's what Blueprint is. Blueprint is my entry point to compound gains of my health. I'm not gonna make the same mistake twice ever again. And that's something I could never do before. And so it's really all the same. 
And so you say, practically, what is the path for human thriving? Mm-hmm. It's compounded gains of improvement, avoiding making the same mistakes. And that, to do that, we need measurement, we need analysis, and we need to bridge ourselves with all these other tools. That's how we scaffold ourselves into the future. Do, do you feel there's any benefit to sometimes have, having that impulsivity and desire late at night to, to eat a cookie? Do, do you think there's like some, some, some gain to that? <laughs> you know, my, my 16-year-old is going through this right now. Okay. So he is repeating what I went through for the past couple of years. Okay. And so it's so, fun, it's so funny to watch. Sure. So he'll say, Dad, tonight, like, here's my stack. And he'll, like, you know, he's got like a donut and he's got like some Sour Patch Kids and like his whole thing. Uh-huh. And he knows that when he does this, he regrets it instantaneously. Right. After he does it, and he regrets it the next day, and his sleep is awful. His HRV's down, his, sleep, his deep sleep is almost gone, and he right. feels awful. Right. And so um, I've told him this many times, it is never, ever, ever worth it. Never. So no. Like, do I value you know, cheating every once in a while? No. I hate it. It's the worst feeling in the entire world. And I finally achieved that point where I can model out the experience and say, if I do this thing, I can imagine what I'm going to experience. But he's getting there. And so this week when I had the conversation, he's just like, yeah, dad, I get it. Like, it's never, ever, ever worth it. After growing through these struggles and re-architecting himself from scratch, Brian decided to start focusing in on tackling the fundamental thing he believes will help humanity. His conclusion was to start Kernel to measure brain activity and therefore give people more insights about their brain. The initial interface approach for Kernel was an invasive implant. After some deliberation, Brian decided to bet the company on a shift to a non-invasive wearable device. I asked him some questions about that decision here. We do imagine this technology being in the hands of millions of people, but also it doesn't need to be to be mainstream. So for example, if we did, if we can do a demonstration showing, um, let's just say, let's say mind wandering, which we've done internally. Mm-hmm. Let's say we, we identify a signature of mind wandering. Mm-hmm. Um, at, you're doing a meditative practice, and we identify a signature for that in the brain, and we collect enough sample sets of doing that to say we've looked at this many people with a large data set. We know the signature. We know this thing. Those insights can be scaled far beyond what those individuals are doing. The insights can scale beyond a a person wearing the technology. Okay, let's let's take grid shock, the one you did today. So let's say what we're trying to look at is, can we tell the difference between an experienced person and an inexperienced, an experienced gamer and an inexperienced gamer? Mm -hmm. And if we can identify neural activity patterns to make that distinction, and then we can get Let's just say we get a bigger data set and get even more accuracy and we can start putting these gradients of prediction. Then the company making that exercise, which in this case is AimLab, if they can say, they can take an inexperienced gamer and say, this is what their brain looks like when they're inexperienced, this is what a world-class gamer's brain looks like. Mm -hmm. And they can then build games to help people traverse the becoming better gamers over time and try to, exceed, try to become a much better game designer with that brain data than they could otherwise. Now, in that scenario, if you have a big enough sample set of people doing the, the study and you have a company doing it, they can deploy that software to, to basically an unlimited number of people without those people actually wearing the device. Yes. Right? You could potentially get more personalization of the training regimen. You may get more, you may go a bit faster if you've got that feedback. But these insights scale far beyond. And so when we say make brain interfaces mainstream, it's people both wearing the device, but also it's the insights that can scale around, around the world uh, without much faster than the actual devices could. What do you think are the current most pressing technical challenges or problems to get it so that there is a widespread adoption of kernel flow? It's... It's doing enough demonstrations where 
people say, I want to measure my brain. So if we think about an analog here, when we go to a restaurant, we typically don't think and wonder, is the food, are the processes they're following going to give me food that is safe to eat? Right. We know they're maintain, they maintain certain temperatures to avoid bacterial growth and we're safe from E. coli because of the procedures and standards. We also buy things at the grocery store when we, we identify that they say we have these attributes like there's you know, uh, no gluten in this product or like people feature signal with their food. And we, we look at these things and say, do I want to consume this product into my body? But it's a, it's a way the company says, you want to buy our product because you know, it's like it meets your health standards or our supplier standards. Or, but they're basically signaling to you and you say, this meets my, my criteria. If you think about that, we don't have the same thing for our brains. A company doesn't build a product, a game product or a social media product or a news product or anything and say, hey, like we've actually done rigorous scientific research looking at the effects of our product on someone's brain. Mm -hmm. And we've demonstrated, you know, and it could be like we've improved it with this quantification process or we've considered that, you know, like they can make all these statements. So we want the same feature signaling where businesses say, we've done this, this rigorous scientific measurement, you, you want to use it for your brain. And then individuals will say, hey, look, anything I'm going to ingest into my brain, literally anything, I want to know who's behind it and what the effects are on my brain. That to me would demonstrate mainstream adoption, where we are aware of how our brain is affected by everything we consume on a daily basis, from food to news, to learning. And this is a technology that's implemented called TDF NIRS. Yes. And in, in the process of starting kernel and at the beginning stages of kernel, you and the team looked at a bunch of different technologies that were available and you landed on this being the best one. Yeah. Um, can you talk about um, wh why and, and the, the different reasonings yeah. behind that? We were. Uh, my, my team and I were in a meeting with one of the world's best neurosurgeons. At the time, we had brought him into, uh, into Colonel to consult with us for three days. Uh, he had been implanting these devices for, I think, his career over 30 years. And we were inquiring what works, what doesn't work. When you're in the surgical room, what are you experiencing? So we just wanted to understand everything from his perspective. At the very end of that three-hour meeting, our wrap-up meeting, uh, we were just kind of shooting the shit, and he said, you know, a new technology, like I've been in this game for a while, a new technology comes along every 15 years or so that changes everything. And he said it, and it just, it's like full stop, uh, just, I just about fell over my chair. And... I wonder, because we had been poking at a whole bunch of technologies, uh, optical and ultrasound and you know, the implantables with electrical, uh, uh, with is, and after that meeting I spun up an internal group to resurface this idea of was there an optical technology that we could look at non-invasively, because I really wanted to build a non-invasive product. If, that was the, if we could do that and we could do it at scale, that was what was going to make neural measurement or BCIs mainstream. But there was no known path on how to do it. Everyone and every expert I spoke to told me there's no known path to do it. And so we, we started looking at this internally and over a few months we generated some interesting momentum and we flipped the entire company's uh, focus to this non-invasive. We did a bet the company move mm -hmm. on looking at non-invasive. Uh, not knowing whether it would work out but we had enough evidence that we thought there was possibly a, a, a breakthrough path here. Can you explain why you were so set on wanting to do non-invasive and you were willing to make that bet the company move? Um, yeah, why not yeah. Why not invasive? Yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty with BCI is, is that the, the intuitions people have about brain-computer interfaces are deep. And it's 
really about control. People imagine that you have a brain interface so that you can control a cursor or text from your brain or move objects, but it's entirely about control orientation. And it, that was so deeply entrenched in the community of what to do with it, I also was playing with the idea of control. And then you take that control and you say, what is the consumer app? Like, what is the killer app? So you say control, killer app, and then almost everything just dies because no technology is good enough for doing that to become widespread. And so then the key thing, the first thing that, that uh, turned everything for me is when I realized it wasn't about control, it was about measurement. And so if you can measure the brain, right, then the world, like science begins with counting. If you can put numbers to the brain, mm -hmm. that opens up uh, brain computer interfaces. And the second thing that was relevant is we do imagine this technology being in the hands of millions of people, but also it doesn't need to be to be mainstream. So for example, if we did, if we can do a, a demonstration showing, um, let's just say, let's say mind wandering, which we've done internally. Mm -hmm. Let's say we, we identify a signature of mind wandering um, you're doing a meditative practice and we identify a signature for that in the brain and we collect enough sample sets of doing that to say we've looked at this many people at the large data set we know the signature we know this thing those insights can be scaled far beyond what those individuals are doing the insights can scale beyond a person wearing the technology this concept of leveraging the data of other brains to better understand your own brain reminds me of what Tesla's doing with their fleet of vehicles. They're leveraging the driving data of the fleet to help all individual cars drive better. Furthermore, they can provide feedback and insights that drivers may not normally pay attention to. For example, Tesla knows how frequently a driver follows the car in front of it very closely. They can also measure the amount of force used to decelerate the vehicle. Same goes for how frequently a driver turns aggressively or isn't paying attention to the road. These factors can then be quantified in the form of a feedback score for a driver. When the feedback is good, the driver will be more likely to continue their good driving. And these same concepts can be applied at Neuralink. Imagine 1 million people who all have Neuralink implants and consented to sharing their brain data. Just like 1 million people who drive Tesla vehicles and consented to sharing their driving data. Neuralink can then work on pinpointing specific target areas in the brain for optimal stimulation, just like Tesla can work on optimizing driving ability. They can also provide feedback to people about how to optimize their brain performance, just like the Tesla safety score. Neuralink is also working on writing neural code. For example, if a part of the motor cortex had a damaged connection to a limb, it could be possible to repair that broken connection to a sufficient, useful level. To continue the metaphor, kernel could also enable the Tesla safety score for the brain or give a user feedback, but they currently don't have products that will actually do the stimulation for the user. They wouldn't drive the car, but they'd help you improve. The non-invasive, non-stimulating approach is preferred by plenty of people as the spectrum of support to dissatisfaction for brain-machine interfaces is a bell curve with very long tails. This is not unexpected given that there's a wide range of social, political, and religious beliefs that guide someone's thoughts about the merging of man with machine. I asked Brian a question about neurostimulation that a Neuropod viewer posted on Twitter. Here's the clip. Longer term, do you see getting into the, the field of, of neurostimulation? So, right so, yeah, certainly a possibility. Although we, uh, I have a much broader definition of stimulation. Stimulation typically refers to like TDCS or you know, some thing like that. And the biofeedback is also a powerful modality. So even in playing grid shot today, you're playing a game as your brain is being measured. And so we look at this thing to say entirely, like, if you have the measurement platform, and if it gets rigorous and it's reproducible, you have numbers, you open up the field to all possible interventions. And so the familiarity with existing stimulation technologies uh, elevates it in people's minds and they point at it as like this is the immediate thing, certainly a possibility. Also, it may open up a possibility of many other different biofeedback modalities that are equally if not more powerful 
uh, that don't require that kind of technology. So we're open to all forms of interventions. Uh, we don't have any preferences because we don't think uh, that there's enough evidence yet to point us in one direction over the other. And, but we're willing to do all simultaneously. Since the primary goals of Neuralink are to number one, solve neurological problems, and two, decrease the probability of bad outcomes associated with artificial intelligence, it's no surprise that the approaches for kernel and Neuralink differ from each other. However, there is indeed some overlap for what each brain interface will be able to do. Both companies will learn about the brain in a way that's useful for future applications, and both companies will help with similar applications. Kernel and Neuralink will measure brain activity in the following areas. Psychedelics, pain measurement, mental health, performance, stroke and TBI, or traumatic brain injury, aging, and attention and focus. Also, Elon's main motivation for starting Neuralink is the threat of artificial intelligence. I asked Brian to share his thoughts about the threat of AI. In many ways, a person's disposition towards AI, whether it's a fear-based thing or excitement-based emotion is reflective of the person's, how they view, view the future and whether they think the future is more going to be a first principles derived future or a zeroth principle derived future. So to, to make the distinction, a first principle is like a known known. You say, what can we absolutely say we know in the shortest possible time frame, and then we can use those first principles to make decisions about this. A zeroth principle thinking is the unknown unknown. So it's like uh, Einstein's special relativity. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it always existed. Right. We just didn't know it existed, but once it was introduced, it changed. It like literally was a new dimension of understanding. Mm -hmm. And so, a zeroth principle discovery doesn't just change a line on a graph, it changes the x and y axis. It changes everything. And so it's the same way like it, when, so yeah, so I guess like I don't, my belief is that AI is likely the best development of intelligence that we could ask for in this moment. It will be the most enabling technology. It will help us overcome what we cannot do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's critical for our survival and thriving. And so I view AI uh, through a lens of enthusiasm because I see the future through zero principles thinking, more so than first principles. And like one, one last example to make this concrete. Mm -hmm. If you look at where zeros came, where recent examples, when AlphaGo was playing the world's best Go player. When world expert Go players saw AlphaGo play those moves, mm -hmm. they described it as moves from another dimension. So the game Go has been sitting, has been played by human genius for thousands of years. You give AlphaGo the game for a couple days, and it came up with several zero, zeroth order moves. And so I'm compel I find that example compelling that when you have a the data in, a, in an environment that allows for machine learning to work very well, it generates insights that humans cannot. And so I think our future is going to have a higher ratio of zeros to ones. And so I, I'm bullish on AI and uh, I'm bullish in the future primarily because I think it'll be more populated by zeros. Next, there's more to share about Elon and Brian's history. During your Lex Friedman interview, uh, there was talk about how Elon considered joining Kernel. Uh, can you talk more about that? We had a good time. You know, we were, I mean, you, you look back, this is like 2015, and we were poking at this problem of assessing what is possible here. And looking at the physical limits, the, what was known, what was not known, and uh, it was energizing, it was fun. And um, yeah, we, we didn't end up working together. It just wasn't the right move, but it was, yeah, I mean, I'm glad we spent the time together. Did you reach out to him? We, we met at a conference. Very good. 
The Colonel team currently has around 100 employees. They're growing their team and scouting excellent talent in fields like engineering, data science, and neuroscience. Roles are mainly based out of Culver City, California, but some positions are remote. My personal impression of the culture and motivations of the team is positive. And to top it off, there's a selection of snacks and drinks available at HQ. One team lead, Eduardo, has a lengthy article describing why he joined Colonel. And one quote that stood out to me was the influence of Colonel's mission in getting him to join the team. He says, It's been famously said that what gets measured gets improved. Without dwelling on the merits of that particular quote, it does outline an important fact. We are blind to what we cannot measure. If your doctor doesn't know your blood pressure, they can never hope to fix it. Similarly, counting your steps or measuring your resting heart rate can lead to significant improvements in fitness and health. Not only can employees work on an inspiring goal, but also work alongside great people. The link to the careers page can be found on www.kernel.com and in the description. Like I mentioned earlier, you are now able to experience flow firsthand. I felt that trying flow was a win-win experience for Colonel and I as I got to learn more about my brain activity while adding an additional participant to their gaming study. If you're in the LA area, here are the three studies that are open. First, there's the gaming study that I did, which is a 30-minute session where you play a target practice game. There's also an attention study, which is 13 visits around 60 minutes per session, and you can be compensated up to $700. There's also an emotion study, which is 2 to 10 visits of 60 minutes per session, for which you'd be compensated $25 per visit. And there's one more study coming soon. Colonel has received FDA authorization to measure ketamine's psychedelic effect on the brain using Colonel Flow with their partner, Cybin. This seems like a unique study to me. The study would help the team explore the possibilities of psychedelic therapeutics before, during, and after a psychedelic experience. Prior to this, patient reporting has been subjective, but the study would align with Colonel's mission of brain measurement by helping to quantify the effects of the therapeutics. Next, we have a more philosophical question for Brian. I'm going to read a quote you said, and this is not as much about Colonel, but um, I'd like to request that you elaborate on its importance. Uh, Never in the history of mankind has the gap between imagination and creation been so narrow. Can you elaborate on it? Yeah. If I said, I said that when reading da Vinci, da Vinci's biography. And you know, sometime in the let's see, for, uh, 15th century, I think, 14th century, da Vinci sketched out a, uh, basically an automobile. And uh, when the James Webb uh, telescope was being assembled, there were researchers that also reassembled the car that he had done. And they found out that it had like remote Braking, it had pass, uh, it had like all these features of modern day vehicles. Mm-hmm. So in that time, Da Vinci knew the engineering structure of how to create a modern day automobile, but he couldn't actually build it. And if you say what exists now, and this is why I started OS Fund, mm-hmm. is OS Fund I invested in I I seeded the, the fund with a hundred million dollars, and it was for the predictable engineering of atoms, molecules, and organisms. So we've, over the past couple decades, we've seen the power of software engineering. And software, obviously, is ubiquitous in society. What we don't have is the same number of people in the world who can program physical matter. And so an example, like I, I invested in, uh, one of the very first investors in Ginkgo Bioworks, mm-hmm. that is, has emerged as a leader in synthetic biology and actually help scale the mRNA vaccine. But they've been able to sh- demonstrate that you actually, you know, their slogan is the future will be grown, not extracted, or something like that. Yeah. But um, we need the ability to, to engineer with precision the physical elements of this world to solve the problems we're trying to tackle. It's not, software is not good enough. It's not an adequate toolkit. And so the companies I've invested in have, begun, have been ranging from like literally atom by atom Lego style building in nanotech uh, using metal organic frameworks to synthetic biology to computational frameworks of, of molecule discovery 
And so together they create this remarkable realization that we have achieved in society this ability to engineer at all these scales. And uh, we'll need it for our thriving. And here's another question from you all. One last question from the audience. Um, If Colonel had infinite financial time and human resources, what would you spend those resources on? It would be, uh, it would be architecting the world's most extensive measurement protocol ever created. And then it would be a, uh, with that measurement protocol, we would then at scale acquire data from a correct number of people to make the relevant statistical reference ranges. And then we would take, we do targeted clinical work. Not, I shouldn't say clinical, we targeted intervention work and treat the brain uh, as the most precious organ we have. Not just from a health perspective, but from it's the brain is is the seed, it's the kernel of the future of intelligence. And our conception of the brain today, I think, uh, are primitive in that we're thinking on level one that if we can just be healthy, we're okay. But it really is. Um, like, why, why are we not obsessed, not only with well-being, but of our conscious experience with each other and of our potential? And every generation does this. Like, every generation, there's a few people who look at the horizon of possibilities and they say, that point. Like, I know it's impossible, but that's the point. And I think right now, we can look at the horizon and we can say, we can legitimately identify the future of human existence as a legitimate thing to work on. It's not too far out, it's actionable today, and the brain is it. And so I'd say uh, we become the, uh, we become the, the most rigorous, and uh, diversified company focused on the brain in the world, measurement and in- intervention, and try to usher in this new aspirational idea that uh, we can be so much more mm-hmm. in zero principle sorts of ways. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you, you chatting today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks again. From our Neuropod team, we'd like to thank the several team members at Kernel that made this episode possible. That'll close it for this premium episode. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.